Thank you so much for checking out the fourth episode of the WeVA podcast. Today I'm joined with Malte Peach, the CTO of DeepSet AI, which has created the Haystack vector search engine. Today we're going to talk about all sorts of topics related to vector search engine, the Haystack library, and the different things that they've built, and all sorts of cool, exciting things around these ideas in neural search. So to get started, uh, Malte, could you tell us about your uh, mission of Haystack and sort of your vision and understanding of vector neural search engines? Yeah, sure. I can do that. Um, so um, basically, I would say my personal background is uh, pretty much described with machine learning engineering, and um, um, yeah, there was probably one key moment uh, in my life that made me up, uh, ending, uh, ending up in NLP. Uh, and that was when I did some research in the US uh, back on um, like healthcare data uh, back then. Um, some numerical values, some like um, uh, blood measurements, time series data, all of that. We built like a fancy model, uh, predicted some, um, some, some nice things. In the end, doctors told us, uh, yeah, that's, that's not new. Uh, we knew that. Uh, it's, it's correct uh, what you predicted, but yeah, not super exciting. Uh, and then it turned out the only, like, or the, let's say the most exciting part uh, that they were curious about was um, uh, some part where we uh, modeled um, or used data, textual data uh, coming from uh, handwritten notes of doctors. Um, and from a modeling perspective, that was uh, <laughs> a very naive modeling, I would say, but in the end, it was the biggest value. And um, that's, I would say, how, how I ended up in NLP and also why we uh, found a deep set in uh, 2018. Uh, because we really saw and believed, hey, like there's so much text data out there in basically every company, but it's in most cases not really used. Uh, there's like it's a, it's a lot of gold out there, but not really leveraged. And in uh, 2018, we thought, okay, yeah, the uh, tooling was uh, okay, but like still models were quite primitive. Uh, but we really believed, hey, there must be like there must be something happening in the next years. There will be innovation. There will be something similar to like ImageNet on, uh, on computer vision, there will be this wave of, of new NLP models that, uh, that make this text data available. And yeah, that's basically how we, we started DeepSet and um, worked with many industry clients. Um, then BERT came out, there was quite like, I would say this ImageNet moment uh, and, and things uh, accelerated a lot. Um, and yeah, what we, what we saw uh, from working with all these uh, industry um, customers um, was basically yeah, that um, it's always every company that we worked with had this issue of accessing information from this, these text amounts, these documents, and finding it and extracting it. And um, that's basically where uh, how, how we started Haystack. Um, we really with the belief, okay, let's build a framework that um, leverages latest research and bridges this gap to production in the industry to make it simple to adopt these latest research methods and really use them in, uh, let's say in production and all, let's say around this, this case of um, neural search, if you wanna say so, uh, we usually say like it's about finding the information and also extracting it. So, so not only this classical search uh, setting where you type something in, you get your results, but could be also that you extract certain uh, entities or certain um, certain information and kick off other processes or so on. Um, yeah, so that's basically how we, how we started Haystack and uh, got, uh, got pretty well adopted faster than we thought. Uh, yeah, we have now contributors from, from all around the world, uh, from Netflix, uh, many other companies um, and use it in production. And um, yeah, what we, what we hear basically as feedback is, um, and also use it as a, say, a strong philosophy of us, um, that the framework is really a Lego Lego box. It's like mm -hmm. kind of building blocks that you can stick flexibly together to some pipelines. And then you move that all in production. You can exchange one of these pieces easily if a new model comes out. So I would say that's, uh, that's pretty much um, um, something that is in our DNA and in the DNA of this project. Mm -hmm. And yeah, for me, I'd say like my vector search image net moment was when I first came across the uh, co-search system from Salesforce Research. And this idea of the pipelines is the first time I really saw this diagram where you look at the document index, the retrieval pipelines going into different downstream applications like summarization, question answering, or uh, say a chat bot. And this kind of idea of having these flowing systems for me, co-search was my ImageNet realization when I first became uh, really excited about these kinds of systems. 
So I'm really impressed uh, as I was looking through the Haystack, uh, how to use it and the different components of it. I really love the pipelines. And so before we get into the sort of the details of the kind of like the library design, I want to ask about more of your opinions on retrieval augmentation and kind of like retrieval transformers. And it's obviously very popular now with things like uh, DeepMind's Retro and OpenAI's WebGPT, this really exciting idea of retrieval augmented transformers. And before I give you a chance to talk, I want to kind of quickly pitch this idea of, do you think that maybe the shape of say AGI or like a, a powerful AI, the next generation of that will be that you have such a powerful reasoning model that all you have to do is just plug in your data and then it can just retrieve it. And then this reasoning model will be able to adapt to any kind of data that you retrieve such that the retrieval augmented pipeline is so strong that you don't really need as much uh, fine tuning. And then from there, we can talk about the farm library and haystack and all sorts of things is debate around retrieval augmentation and then the need for fine tuning. Um, yeah, so I, I definitely see that retrieval augmented pipelines or models are like a, a super important piece towards maybe AGI at some point. And, um, and I mean, I think you can take it from two sides or two perspectives. Uh, one, let's say just coming from plain transform models. And if you talk about something like question answering, retrieval is just basically the, the way to uh, speed things up, right? And to make it scale to millions of documents, having like some kind of filter before and, uh, and really just seeing it that way. Um, and that's how we, I think, initially kind of started it. Um, then I think with the, um, say, the rise of all these gigantic language models and uh, a more like generative approaches, um, it's really, I think, now about these two schools, two, say, uh, mindsets, two beliefs, what, we're, what is uh, today actually helpful and what, where we'll end up in the future. Um, I'm pretty sure that for today and the next years, um, uh, I would place my bet on retrieval uh, augmented pipelines, um, mainly for two reasons. Um, one is um, um, basically interpretation. So um, if you, let's say, have something like um, uh, GPT-3 or like a, um, uh, from OpenAI, one of the models, um, and you ask the query a question and it gives you the answer, uh, it's super hard to uh, understand if that's correct or not. Uh, you don't know how it was generated, what kind of information is it based on. And that's a very powerful thing with, uh, with retrieval and extractive methods, right? That you, uh, with our users, often it's, they get these results, but then they often also ask, where was that written? Like, uh, give me the exact passage and uh, what, what really data is that based on? And that's very easily possible. Um, the second thing um, uh, you already mentioned, like fine tuning or the way to adapt it to new data sets. Um, if I have something like, I don't know, GPT-3 or another generative model, um, usually trained on a big public corpus from the internet, if that's your domain, perfect. But uh, our customers are mainly like enterprise clients, um, maybe from aerospace domain, from some legal domain, from finance, uh, uh, some very deep tech stuff. Uh, and there are usually like words um, and meanings that are uh, very different to, to general mm -hmm. internet Wikipedia corpus. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, these, these big models are not trained on it, so they don't work. Um, and they get outdated very easily, right? If, um, if you ask uh, one of the, let's say now one year old models about, uh, about Omicron or COVID or whatever, uh, they will, won't know, and it's very hard to, to update. Uh, Why with retrieval, it's just, hey, I index <laughs> one new document today, and out of the box, my, my model knows or can find this information. Um, so I think this, these are two powerful advantages. Um, still, uh, like retrievers, uh, dense retrievers, for example, there, there is, uh, I think, some, um, uh, in many cases, need for fine tuning, uh, and uh, also like, get a lot of boost if you fine tune for your domain. Um, but it's then usually some, something you do once and then you can still like ingest new data mm -hmm. and you're fine and you don't need to retrain like every, I don't know, second day. Yeah, I, lo I love those two arguments for the benefits of retrieval, the interpretation of seeing what it's returned and then the ability to adapt to new data sets and uh, changing information. And I think those are two huge selling points. And so kind of to dig a little deeper into the fine tuning part. I want to ask a little more about what do you perceive as being more valuable for most use cases, fine tuning the vectorizer, so say fine tuning the dense passage retrieval step, the, the Siamese BERT or the, whatever you're using to encode the data, or fine tuning the reader or the reasoner, say, and that kind of thing. And 
say not only just fine tuning it on your data set, but fine tuning it to uh, to be processing the retrieved context. So so when you're fine tuning the question answering model, have it be fine tuned to the retriever component of it. So it's used to seeing that additional context and then that's very, and then that specific kind of retrieved context from the end to end system. Um, very good question. I, I'd say it really depends on the domain and use case and the data set. Um, so if I look a bit back at, at our customers, in many cases, I think we uh, we get a lot big boost when fine tuning the, the reader part as well. Um, uh, especially if it's like very, specific domains, very specific questions. Um, and, and the style is important about the answer as well, right? Sometimes it's not, these days, not only about factual questions anymore, like asking, I know where was this and that founded or in which year, mm -hmm. uh, but it's really more open questions, uh, interpretory questions, like, I don't know, what's the, what's the strategy of this competitor in China? Uh, and <laughs> there you can really get uh, get good performance if a few labels. It doesn't require much fine tuning, but a bit helps a lot. Um, and um, I think on the retriever side uh, or like vectorizer, um, it's, it's still helpful um, if um, your data set is very large uh, and um, if um, also like combinations of, of retrievers don't work out for you. So what we, for example, sometimes do is combining a sparse retriever with dense retriever and you kind of hit a barrier there, um, then, then of course, fine tuning, uh, fine tuning retriever also can be an option. Um, and I think the, um, this is, uh, as I said, like this, as this depends, it's very important that you have the tooling to find out, right? That if you build a pipeline, um, that you have a way to easily analyze, like what is my bottleneck? Is it the retriever that drops performance uh, or is it the reader or any other component that I have afterwards? Um, and that was also, I think, one, uh, one of the motivations back then to, to really introduce these flexible pipelines in Haystack. And uh, recently we refactored the whole evaluation part so that you get, can get reports. Okay, that's performance of, of retriever node, of the reader node, and you really see um, uh, what what is worth improving and fine tuning. Super cool. And um, so, I'm so I'm really curious about this uh, farm library that you've built out for uh, fine tuning and the different components that go into it. We'd imagine that uh, fine tuning any kind of deep learning model, you'd want to do things like maybe have these adapter layers, like the compactor adapter, these kind of things so that you don't have to fine tune 100% of the parameters of the pre-trained model. Uh, maybe things like a hyperparameter optimization with like a hyperband kind of, these kind of libraries for that kind of search. Things like, uh, you know, sparsity and then, and then more so just like standard tools for training deep learning models like mixed precision and I saw gradient accumulation in farm these kinds of things that generally uh, facilitate training any deep learning, any large deep learning model. So what kind of things are uh, specific to farm and specific to fine tuning the reader models with the, uh, like with the retrieval appendage as a part of the pipeline? Mm -hmm. um, so farm was basically our, I think our first open source project that we published back then and kind of haystack came afterwards and mm -hmm. actually now migrated quite some, some parts from farm uh, uh, to haystack so that we have it really like all integrated. So um, basically all of the modeling related to retrievers, to readers uh, is now happening in, uh, in Haystack. Um, but still farm is um, from a, from a um, you know, um, design perspective, um, I think quite interesting. The core idea back then was that we really have one say language model as a component and then multiple prediction heads that you can stick up, uh, stick upon uh, these language mm -hmm. model. And um, this is still something we, um, for example, now think a bit about for, for some question answering tasks. Um, might be helpful to have one prediction head that, uh, for example, um, gives you the, um, the span answer, um, but another one that, um, for example, can, can uh, classify this answer or can give you um, just binary, like yes, no. Like this is the, mm -hmm. the span that I found and it's like a, yeah, it's like a yes uh, answer or no answer. Um, and uh, all of what you mentioned to um, the, the fine tuning tooling that is out there um, is, uh, I think there's like a lot of potential. Um, we, uh, we just implemented um, a, a distillation approach. I think distillation is still, there, there's a lot of methods out there, but I think there's still um, a lot of potential to, uh, to improve and, uh, uh, and um, has a huge benefit for, um, for industry and production. Um, Tiny Bird is, uh, I think, a nice, uh, nice idea and example 
Um, so it's I think to one degree about the modeling part, distilling maybe from a larger model, the knowledge to something smaller, um, but also combining this idea uh, with something like data set augmentation. Uh, so everything that helps me as a developer in industry to, to fine tune a, a model with less data. I think that's that's, uh, that's uh, super nice. Um, and ideally it's then also faster for inference. Yeah, and I think the, um, the adding of the retrieval component, you don't need to store the knowledge in the parameters of each of the separate heads so you can get even more efficiency gains of not needing to have some 12 layer, uh, 100 million parameter encoder base that then attaches to each of the heads. Hopefully the retrieval model can uh, replace that and then these models can be more parameter efficient. So kind of uh, transitioning a bit away from the topic of fine tuning, I was really impressed when I came across the DeepSet Cloud GUI. It's beautiful. I love looking at it. It's such a cool way of organizing the tasks around constructing your, say, uh, first example of vector search. If anyone listening to this has their data set and they just want to uh, see one of these pipelines come together, I highly recommend checking out this DeepSet Cloud GUI. It's as easy as pick your language, upload your documents, click and pick the components of the pipeline from retriever question answering or retriever summarization. And then, and then even from there, the REST API deployment. And I love that idea of just the easy search API deployment. So how do you see that kind of thing of, um, of this GUI interface design? What kinds of things have gone into the, uh, into the development of the DeepSet Cloud GUI? So for us, it was really important to find a, um, say a complementary product to our open source uh, uh, project Haystack. We didn't want to end up with a, with a model where we say, okay, like there's a, I know a super nice performing model, but we don't publish it in open source. We, that's part of the, uh, the commercial offering. Um, at the same time, of course, we are a company, we need to maintain the open source project. So we need a um, sustainable business model. So the idea um, uh, of this combination now is really that we have Haystack as a, as a Python framework uh, who really helps developers um, to build easy prototypes and solve the problem of scatter technologies. Uh, so you have, models, you have databases, you have I don't know, REST APIs. It's quite hard to stick all of that together and <laughs> uh, have, have all these skills in say one person or a single team. And uh, Haystack open source is, is meant for that. It's a Python developer framework to, to solve it. Uh, and if that's fine for you, you can just go ahead with that, bring, bring that to production, build everything you want around it, um, fine. Um, still, what we saw is that uh, it's not always only about the technologies, but it's also a lot about uh, workflows, about collaboration, and uh, having really the whole, um, say, life cycle, the whole ML of life cycle of a, of a product. And, um, and that's why we built DeepSet Cloud. Uh, it's basically one SaaS platform where you really can start, as you said, you upload your corpus, you index it, you can configure your pipelines in different modes, either from code or uh, just from like a YAML um, uh, that you put there. Um, and uh, you can easily share demos with colleagues, get your feedback, hey, do these results make sense, yes or no? And instead of then having this feedback in Excel sheets floating around, you have it like all integrated in your, in your database and can easily say, ah, like, okay, I got this feedback, this pipeline is better than this one, or trigger some retraining, fine tuning based on this feedback, create labels, so it's really like all integrated. And once you, once you found, uh, say, the perfect pipeline or that, that fits your needs, just basically one click uh, to scale it and, and bring it to production. And uh, we will do all the, the scaling uh, in the background and in our cluster, it's fully hosted. And you can integrate then basically the API to, to your own product, uh, wherever you want this, this functionality. Yeah, I think this modularity is so exciting. This idea that you can just uh, point to the API endpoint to add in some kind of, uh, say you wanna have model inference as a part of the pipeline and you wanna just point to the API and plug it into the existing pipeline. And generally the idea of, of sharing the search API is such that anyone can integrate anyone's data set uh, connected to these pipelines by just querying one of these endpoint demos. and. Uh, say on Weaviate, we have the Wikipedia demo and we have just the public endpoint. So if you, if anyone in their working directory wants to just paste in this address, you can just start querying the vector search engine and people can share their data sets. And this is really exciting, like open source collaboration of uh, sharing all these different things. And so I want to ask you kind of, uh, we've seen things like Hugging Face Spaces and, and the Model Hub as uh, they share model weights and increasingly Hugging Face is uh, hosting raw data sets. 
What do you think about the future of uh, organizing these vector search demos and then having these uh, ability to not only just access data sets, but to be able to just quickly apply all these uh, functionalities like search just through these public endpoints? Yeah, so I think it's, uh, it's uh, first of all, amazing work that Hugging Face is doing and we are in a close exchange with them and it's really, it's really great what they're building and what they're doing for the whole, whole space. Um, and um, like how we see, how we see um, what we are doing um, is basically, I would say, one layer above, probably. Uh, so, for mm -hmm. example, we integrate with a Hugging Face Model Hub. Uh, so, if you use DeepSet Cloud, you can basically load any model that you have hosted there or that is, that is public there. And I still think that uh, that right now what is missing is this kind of, let's say, orchestration layer where you bring things together. We can say, okay, this model, this data set, or my own data set. Um, here's a quick demo and I can share it with my colleagues or I can, can, can share it in the public. Um, and, uh, and that's exactly, I think, what, what um, so we are building, what I think many others are also building. I think it's important to, to have, um, to really empower developers to, to cover this whole, let's say, life cycle to show something. And I think that's something missed also in, in many uh, ML projects uh, that you focus a lot on the modeling part. <laughs> but then if you show know, your colleagues or others, uh, and it's uh, it's something quite hard to relate to it and for others to try it out. And I think this is uh, so important, like um, um, first of all, to validate what you are building as an engineer, uh, but also to um, say trigger creativity and, and inspiration. Huh? So um, if, for example, people from, from some business departments, uh, they, they saw some of our demos and um, and they thought, ah, like that's cool. I have a completely different use case, but can I also use it for this and that um, for, for example, chatbots. We have some, some people who, um, who use now QA for uh, answering questions within chatbots or for uh, parsing, let's say if you have incoming documents, every time an invoice comes in, you wanna ask five questions and uh, uh, like who, who did issue with this invoice, uh, what's the amount and, and kind of the answer you use, uh, you use to um, store it in a, in a structured database and kick off other automated processes. Um, and I think all this, this kind of innovation is so much easier if you have something tangible, something you can try out and, and share uh, with others. Yeah, and congratulations again on the DeepSec Cloud GUI. It is such an amazing organization of this orchestration layer and a user interface to just uh, point to different data set endpoints, different retriever models. And, and now let's get into kind of these different flavors of retriever models. Uh, you mentioned the idea of combining TFIDF and BM25 with, say, uh, Siamese BERT, Sentence BERT, and having these two different kinds of ways of, um, of uh, different ways of structuring your retrieval model. But I, I kind of think another thing that's interesting as we translate into the connection between the WeVA document store and then the Haystack pipelines is the idea of uh, symbolic annotation of the neural vectors and of the neural search. So. Uh, for example, if you're searching through scientific papers and you want to add the symbolic filter uh, published in CVPR, or published in ICML, or authored by a particular, uh, well, let's say an institution could say an author might not have that many publications such that you need to really do a neural search through it. But these kind of symbolic filters on top of the uh, neural search, have you thought a lot about what how that kind of changes neural search and how that kind of uh, maybe offers another way of looking at the retrieval uh, pipelines between say TFIDF BM25 being one thing and then vector distance being a different thing. Yeah, I think that's a, a, an absolutely brilliant feature of, that VV8 <laughs> has and, uh, and actually um, I think differentiates VV8 to, um, to many of the other vector search engines out there. And um, for us uh, was also, I think the, one of the main reasons why we uh, integrated it into Haystack uh, because we heard that a lot from the community. We saw that a lot in our, um, with our own customers um, that really this combination of um, say uh, um, structured data and metadata that you can filter plus uh, uh, vector search is, uh, is super powerful. And um, um, I mean, first of all, it's a nice, nice way to kind of uh, narrow down your search space. So if you have really like millions of documents in most use cases, there is some some text, some I don't know time stamp, something that you can that helps you to narrow down your search space immensely. And uh, this, of course, is a direct direct impact on uh, on the search quality. Um, and at the same time, of course, it's tricky to implement. Uh, so it's uh, um, it really has to, I think, be um, closely tied to the vector search engine, um, uh, and has to happen if you have something like approximate nearest neighbors. Um, 
which I think is quite important at uh, in production deployments, um, then uh, it becomes tricky. And um, and yeah, but having this combination, I think, is uh, super nice. And in general, I would say leveraging metadata or structural information is uh, is, uh, is super helpful. Um, one thing, for example, on our roadmap that you want to explore further is as well to to leverage document structure uh, even more. So that you can, ex let's say you have um, a PDF. Uh, so you have like a lot of titles in there, uh, maybe captions of images. And as of today, most uh, most search engines and, uh, and models um, treat that in the end as similar, like plain text, uh, but really using this information, hey, this is a, another headline or um, this is, I don't know, the, the a title of the, the chapter. Um, this is, makes, makes life so much easier at, uh, at query time. Um, and uh, I think also for uh, like building embeddings then for these kind of uh, information is, uh, is, a, is a nice direction in future that we not say, do hard filtering or then uh, BM25 on this uh, kind of metadata, but really embed those titles, embed the whole document structure and, uh, and use that at query time. Yeah, and it's interesting because you can still use these filters in the HNSW uh, ANN index algorithm. So we build these data structures up so that we can facilitate the speed of doing vector distance comparisons, but you can still add these symbolic filters within something like an HNSW graph as uh, Eddie and Dillocker at WeV8 has explained many times and I'm finally starting to understand it a little bit. But um, so let's get into this um, query classifier. The idea that the query classifies whether this is a uh, TFIDF query, or if this is a neural search query. And I want to get your thoughts on whether you think it's uh, a worthwhile direction to say have a query refinement step where it adds the symbolic annotation onto the neural query. So rather than saying, oh no, this is mostly keyword, we want to make, like say, um, say you Google something about a company like Uber, and then you want to do a regular expression symbolic filtering where say, make sure Uber is in the title of the return article. Uh, do you think we could have a intermediate query refinement neural layer trained with, uh, you know, gradient descent and, and some kind of annotated data set for this that would add the symbolic annotation onto the neural search layer rather than, say, separately querying a TFIDF index or separately querying, say, like even an SQL index because it's like a purely symbolic search or like purely symbolic different from, say, you know, some kind of sparse, some kind of like machine learning style based representation of the data. Do you think that kind of thing could be uh, fruitful? Yeah, I mean, in general, I think it's it's uh, it's an interesting direction. Um, and the query classifier in, in Haystack pretty much comes from the um, I would say from a from the user behavior. Uh, so what we mm -hmm. uh, what we saw is that um, many companies, if they already have a product which allows search, people are used to keyword search, right? And that's what they type in, and it takes some time to um, to um, make them aware. Hey, like there is a if you, there's a smarter way of searching, right? And uh, if you really put a full sentence, a full question, whatever, more context in, then you get better search results. And that's the same thing with Google, right? They, mm -hmm. they are slowly transitioning towards, uh, uh, towards let's say more um, contextual search and they suggest queries and um, they display, hey, is that what you like the question that you, you were asking? And, um, and I think that all goes towards this say, zero click search that you have search something and then you directly see what you want and you don't need to click on the on the website and then find what you're looking for um but i think yeah there's this uh say educational period and um and that's where we uh, where we implemented or added this query classifier that you can really see hey this is a keyword query uh and then maybe just use your existing old search engine could be just plain pm25 or whatsoever um and um you know the other side if it's already a, a semantic um, query, you kind of route it to your to your second stack, and uh, and that really giving you say both of the best of both worlds. But if you, because if you have I think really say classical keyword queries, um, what we saw is that at least the most most dense retrievers don't work that well. If you just query for let's say Uber, um, yeah, it's, uh, probably really looking specifically for this one. Um, and and uh, BM25 probably outperforms. Yeah, we've talked about this topic uh, many times. We love this term of serendipity, this idea of uh, you know so not really knowing what you're searching for sort of is a good way of thinking about how to traverse through neural search results and also sort of blurring the lines between the task descriptions of uh, like retrieval, re-ranking, and then recommendation systems. 
all kind of blurring into the same kind of task with search and with uh, neural search. And, and yeah, I really like the idea of uh, using the user behavior as you kind of uh, fine tune this way of thinking about it. So maybe thinking about like, uh, you know, dressing up the query with neurosymbolic and uh, maybe even graph structured cross reference linking, uh, then having maybe like a special user input embedding uh, specific to each user based on their user data or something to help them kind of exp help them understand the neural search because yeah, it's it's definitely interesting when you search for something and get a completely unrelated thing, but because it, it's like this fuzzy way of relating the things, it's definitely an interesting thing and. Um, so transitioning into some kind of new innovations around the space, I really want to get your take quickly on um, on what you think will be the impact of like having longer input sequences to transformers. So say going beyond 512 tokens, models like Big Bird, Sparse Transformer, Long Form, and these kind of things of, uh, especially it seems with retrieval, being able to not just average out the embeddings, but maybe have the attention within and like the parametric kind of processing within the same input. Um, I think that's a, a, an obvious and a big step forward and, mm -hmm. uh, and a super important one. I think uh, um, at the moment, yeah, developers pretty much got used to this 512 tokens. It already seems like a, a fixed <laughs> concept yeah. in the mind of, of <laughs> developers, but of course it's not. And, uh, and uh, I think it just was, for me, what actually is a bit surprising that it's, uh, uh, it takes such a long time to uh, kind of make this step. I mean, there's, yeah, of course, some, some models out there, Big Bird, you mentioned um, uh, long former and so on. Um, but still, I think for many tasks, they don't perform equally well. Um, I, I do also believe that for retrieval, uh, it, it can make a big difference. Um, um, and um, I mean, uh, one big impact, I think, will be on the speed side. Uh, if, you're, if you really have an efficient model there, I don't need to like split documents any further like in these these passages have uh, sliding windows and, and all of that um uh, it will be immensely helpful and i think it's just a for me it would be just a matter of time to uh, that we get to a point where we don't think of 512 tokens <laughs> as, a, as a limit anymore and i think maybe it'll come in parallel advances in thinking about tokenization like uh, things like i think it's called n-gram transformers they look at uh, different ways to not just have subword or byte pair level encoding where they have a, other kinds of strategies of maybe tokenizing it, and that might come into play with the things like bot like computational bottlenecks compared to all isomorphic kind of transformer designs and maybe these kinds of things. And so one other thing maybe is using the document structure could be a way to further increase the retrieval step. Uh, what are your thoughts on kind of incorporating the structure of a document, whether it's a scientific paper and you maybe have like, this is the introduction, this is the related works, and I'm sure all sorts of industry things have that kind of style with this. So, man, it's not just like a block of text from the top to the bottom. Yeah, um, I think it, it becomes immensely helpful if you if you go to, let's say, real world documents uh, that are like not always structured in the same way. Um, one example is, for example, uh, is, is also like you know, company wikis uh, or like uh, short documents of, uh, let's say, meeting notes. Uh, no one writes like a full. A full length paragraph explaining everything in full context, but it's often really, I don't know, five headlines, three bullet points, that's it. And uh, what we see is that um, yeah, if you have a model that is trained on, say, Wikipedia or natural questions, uh, and then to try to apply it to such a document format, uh, that's quite tough. And, um, and uh, that's why I think like yeah, making use of this kind of document structure even more like formatting what is bold uh, just like what what we used from let's say the visual editor i think is also helpful to to give us input to to our models and um and um, let them leverage this as well yeah and i really like this paper called a uh, hypertext language model where the htlm where they keep the html html tags from the web scraping so that you have the uh you know ul tag li li so that you have that kind of structure yeah. And then they do things like when they're prompting it to get the inference, they'll just add the title task to like title brackets mask. And then it performs better because you, the scale of the data and the scale of that kind of free annotation. So then another kind of thing that's like lurking in these text data sets mostly are tables. And especially with, you know, I'm really interested in looking through scientific paper data sets and having these tables. And so what do you, firstly, uh, what do you think is the best way to represent tables for the downstream processing? Is it say, HTML tags where you have say table header, table row that maybe 
I don't know if they, if that's the best way of doing it. I've seen an, an interesting thing of like wrapping it in pandas data frames and trying to have that kind of pipeline. What's your thinking around table question answering within this kind of framework? Um, yeah, so we see that's a super interesting direction. And um, when we started with Haystack pretty much focusing on, on text data, but it was uh, I think yeah, clear from, from day one that it will uh, evolve to more data types. And the vision for Haystack is really to, um, uh, to, to have a semantic layer that you have like any say textual input, any query you want to find information uh, and query that into your whole say data base or data lake, whatever is in there. And, um, and of course, many others are focusing on images, also interesting. But what we saw from community and then our clients is actually that tables is the more pressing uh, demand after, after text documents, um, especially from financial, financial institutions. Uh, they have like a lot of uh, annual reports, for example, where mm -hmm. information is stored in tables, scientific papers, you mentioned it. Um, in technical documentation, you often have also a kind of table overviews um, and uh, making sense out of that is, uh, is, is, uh, is super helpful. Um, in, terms of, in terms of representation, yeah, I think um, there are, there's still not really a standard out there when you look also at papers and models, how they do it. Um, what we thought or that we found is, um, yeah, I think Pandas data frame is from a user perspective now again, is kind of a standard interface. It's not a really standard for the modeling part yet, but it's a very nice, um, let's say exchange format. And you can easily um, get, I don't know, a table out of, uh, of SQL, put it in a data frame. You can pass a table from a PDF document, put it in a Pandas data frame. You can do some interactions uh, easily with it. You can inspect it. Um, and then you can kind of pass it down to a, to a model and uh, how it's represented there. It's then a bit of a question of what the model wants and expects. Um, yeah, so overall, I think it's a, it's a super interesting direction. And um, last year, I think also like a lot of innovation happened there with um, uh, Tapas uh, making big steps forward. Um, but we also recently implemented, uh, uh, there's another model called uh, row column intersection. Um, so I think there's still also a lot of different approaches out there and uh, we'll see which will, which will make it in the end. Uh, that's I think also the really exciting part uh, about this, this whole field still. Um, but um, I think they are now at a, at, a, at a tipping point where they become useful for, for industry. And that's, uh, that's quite, quite interesting. Um, you, they, I mean, I'm not sure if everyone is kind of aware of what, what you can do there right now, but it's, uh, it's can really uh, ask questions where the model then finds the, the specific cell in the table. So you can ask, I don't know, who won the Champions League last year uh, or soccer Champions League last year, and it will find the, the club who, who won that. Um, but you can do also like aggregational operations. And that's, I think, quite, quite interesting. It can ask how many times did uh, Bayern Munich won the championship? And it will basically kind of create a, um, something like a SQL query and ask like, okay, well, where in this table is this club and count how often it appears, or you can do like an average uh, of this. And, um, and uh, if you think this a bit further, uh, it opens up a whole, whole new kind of data set, which is then not only the small table in the paper, but it's really like a whole SQL table or a whole SQL uh, database. And you have a model that kind of produces the SQL query. And, um, and uh, I know you can have a, you are maybe a business analyst and you wanna ask like, what's the average revenue for, uh, I don't know, China last week in this product segment. And you can have a, basically a model that builds this query and gives you the answer. And um, I think this will be then super powerful. Yeah, I, I love this idea. And I've, um, I like this paper called Turning Tables, where the idea is instead to have like a natural language generator from the table. So you parse the table into natural language. And then uh, maybe, you know, you don't have to have be so multimodal between table and text. And you just kind of have all text, even if it's in these two different kind of styles. I think it's, it would be really cool kind of also maybe to try collecting uh, data sets of, of a table Te the table and then the image like the plot that describes what's in the table and then maybe also like what they call the citance or maybe like the figure citance that where the figure is being referenced in the text to kind of come up with those kinds of tuples and see if that can uh, kind of power the application of that kind of idea of uh, reasoning through tables and another really like kind of interesting idea I think is adding images videos I think videos too there's like a lot of video information things like as we record this podcast and all sorts of 
it, it kind of is like easier to make videos than it is to make uh, to write write articles. And maybe also there's information in the audio, like the tonality, the way that you say things. Probably some more information there for some applications. What do you think about like image search and adding these kinds of data types as well to to the, the pr probably like text search is kind of like the dominant thing it seems. Um, yeah, I think it really depends on, on the industry and um, and uh, for sure I think there's the, everything that is in the web is uh, <laughs> is mostly I'd say uh, on these data types, uh, images, videos, audio, like super interesting. Um, we had uh, a few months ago like um, something we call Hacky Friday, so once a month in the company every developer or every every employee actually can work on on anything right that he or she is interested and uh and uh, two developers there built um, like a podcast search for example uh, where you can uh, uh, search for podcasts and uh, i think for these kind of use cases that's uh, super nice and um and if you also think it a bit further um really having then multimodal models that uh, that not only let's say can query it but can really learn from different modes and mm -hmm. uh, combine this knowledge. I think that's an interesting so that you, maybe your company, you don't have so much video data, but you're using a model that uh, used video data to, to gather, um, say the, the, the initial knowledge and you can still apply it to other data sources. I think that's super interesting. And um, yeah, I think with uh, uh, some of the current models, we are a bit going in this direction. Um, um, so I think it's, uh, as, as we mentioned earlier, um, if you have a multimodal model, I'm still curious if, um, if these models will become then very efficient if you're, let's say, just using them for text data, or if you have, like, say, a lot of overhead, a lot of extra parameters just to um, cover, let's say, audio, but maybe in your uh, deployment, you actually don't care about uh, audio. So is, is that really a, a value, um, uh, or is it just overhead that you carry around and um, you know, uh, let models grow and inference times kind of explode. Yeah, I've been thinking about that so much as well. Uh, I really like this paper called Vulcanization, where they're able to use images to facilitate like the glue benchmark for language understanding. And uh, as I'm trying to process uh, like scientific text and deep learning, thinking maybe the figures, the illustrations of, of the algorithms can maybe be useful. And hopefully, yeah, like efficiency gains achieved by this kind of multimodal fusion. And, and another thing, uh, just like another kind of data modality would be like graph structure. So what do you think about graph structure? And I, I think when I think about graph structure, I think about how much the complexity of it can, it can kind of blow up unless it's like a citation graph or like a friendship graph or like something that's natively graph structured. But this idea of like particularly adding graph linking between uh, any kind of thing that might be in your database and then maybe having like knowledge graph style, like PyTorch, big graph, deep walk, no defect, these kind of embeddings on that kind of graph structured, uh, adding it to any kind of data, say, sort of artificially. Um, yeah, I mean, um, if, it, if, if it works out and if you have such a graph, um, <laughs> yeah. it's awesome. I think you can leverage it a lot um, and, and do a lot of interesting uh, inference, a lot of interesting queries. Um, I mean, I think there are these two kind of categories, right? Like more, say, classical knowledge graphs, and uh, and a lot of stuff that happened also in the let's say early two thousands, um, and then more recently, I would say these uh, um, uh, graph neural networks uh, that uh, that really use their structure also at uh, uh, at, at modeling time. Um, for the let's say the more classical part, more classical knowledge graphs. Um, we actually explored this direction um, earlier this year because we um, heard it also a lot from community people um, having also some some of these like bigger corporates for uh, especially having uh, such uh, structures in place um, and wanted then them to use uh, or to leverage at, uh, at search time at query time um, and um, if you have a high quality graph I think that's awesome and it's hard to beat uh, if you have uh, if you look at Google search um, still, a lot of the uh, the answers uh, are, are powered by um, some um, some knowledge graph. Um, the biggest problem that I see there in, in practice is uh, if you're not one of the I don't know top ten tech companies out there, um, it still uh, needs a lot of effort to produce these knowledge graphs. Uh, ideally, automatically, you just have a corpus and create this graph automatically out of it, uh, and then to maintain it uh, to really. 
make sure that the quality is uh, is consistent over time if things change because uh, um, yeah, I think the, the worst thing is if you have a knowledge graph with every knowledge base, uh, if you have a knowledge graph that's outdated, you know, then it's, <laughs> it's, it's really bad. Um, so I think if there is a way to efficiently construct these kind of knowledge graphs, um, that would make a big leap. Um, you know, right now, I think it's for many companies quite, quite tough to create one. Yeah, and I think there's kind of like two sides of, as we mentioned earlier with this idea of query refinement and adding symbolic tagging to your neural search, that's one way to use the knowledge graph. Whereas the other way would be you use the knowledge graph in the training loop to influence the vectorization of your original data objects. And that second one being the one that's maybe more prohibitive and maybe more uh, challenging to really make it happen. But things like say the weave 8 layer make it really easy to just kind of use your knowledge graph annotation to, to filter your search and guide it and help it that way. Whether really getting a multimodal graph embedding added to an image embedding, text embedding, that thing might be a little more challenging to really uh, work out in practice. And so that kind of thing, yeah, thinking about that kind of graph structured and uh, we is definitely one of my kind of favorite things about uh, the Weavey Vector Search. So we've covered a ton of different topics, I think, already. And I'm curious, like, um, kind of what's on your roadmap in the terms of like which kind of ideas exciting you the most right now about vector search engines overall? So um, I think it's generally like what we, uh, it's, it's a lot still about uh, making this uh, easily scale. And uh, what we look right now, or like what we implemented recently is, uh, is um, basically deploying pipelines uh, with the Ray framework. I'm not sure if you had a look at it, <laughs> but it's like really, I think, super exciting framework for distributed computation and uh, really makes it easy um, to, uh, for example, take a, a pipeline with different nodes and then run nodes independently on different machines, scale them independently, um, and, uh, and um, have them all connected. So that's, uh, I would say, from a production deployment side, uh, um, quite interesting. Um, then um, everything, let's say, around this data augmentation and simplifying this fine-tuning domain adaptation step. Uh, so. Um, for example, one paper that we recently looked at is uh, it's called like GPL, like generative pseudo labeling um, uh, for I think unsupervised unsupervised dense retrievers. Um, and the idea there is basically that you create you have a model that creates some query answer pairs or query document pairs in that case, and uh, you use a cross encoder to kind of label this and score this. And uh, a cross encoder usually Gives you better performance for, for these type of query tasks. I mean, that's why they're used for, for re-ranking, um, but they are rather slow. Uh, so use this kind of, let's say, bigger model, teacher model again to create a data set uh, without any human labels, just you put a corpus and it, you get these labels. Um, and then you train a smaller bi encoder based on this data set. And I think these kind of <laughs> approaches like using models, like bigger models, more expensive models to create something useful then to create, like to train a smaller one. These kind of, uh, uh, let's say tricks uh, is what, what uh, really interests me. Um, and I think are like uh, quite helpful for, for industry. Um, um, that's one direction. Um, the other, I think, is all, everything around continual learning. Uh, I think really incorporating human feedback, um, either if the model is already in production, um, you probably want to measure, okay, what, what are people searching, what are, what do they think of these results? Incorporating that in your uh, in your model retraining, um, but also in, in earlier steps, um, if you do some labeling, how can you fuse in model predictions there? Like everything that's I would say between uh, human and machine <laughs> collaboration uh, and yeah. I think really is what we are doing these days. Um, it it's fascinates me. Yeah, awesome. That's a lot of interesting stuff. So to kind of uh, unpack it a little bit and go step by step. Yeah, as, as we were talking earlier about uh, the farm fine tuning library and maybe things like that might be specific to retrieval augmented pipelines, that idea of having the knowledge distillation from the cross encoder or like the try, try encoder even where you have say query uh, relevant or like um, you know, like query relevant document and then like negative relevant document, right? And the kind of design of a try encoder where as you generalize that to however, but the difference being that it's in the input directly and then you have the attention over this whole thing. And the idea of distilling those representations down into the Siamese encoder, which is faster, doesn't require 
as many comparisons for inference. And yeah, I think that's really interesting of like maybe like a unique part of a fine tuning library that would be appended to a vector search engine library kind of, so to say. And then, yeah, I really like the data augmentation, uh, the idea of like robustness and being robust to negations and that kind of thing and really testing that in uh, retrievals. Cause uh, yeah, just in general, that idea that if you add like not or switch the named entity, it doesn't react to that is sounds like a huge problem for retrieval pipelines. And then yeah, continual learning that catastrophic forgetting thing definitely still seems to be like the Achilles heel of deep learning, even if it does seem like big models somehow don't aren't affected by it, I guess, because they have the parametric capacity to store all these tasks in it. And then kind of lastly, um, to come back to the distributed pipeline and Ray and uh, distributing the computation of the nodes. Could you give me like an example more so, so I can better understand how, like what parts of the retrieval component are being uh, parallelized? Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, I would say it's not so much about um, say the single retrieval um, node, but in, um, in, in, in Haystack, really more if you have say bigger pipelines where typically let's say there's a, this might be a dense retriever. There might be also a sparse retriever. Then maybe you combine it. Then there's a reader model. Maybe you have a summarizer as well. Um, and uh, and what Ray allows you is to basically abstract um, from these nodes and put them on the like encrypt them with the resource they need. Uh, so you can say, okay, maybe this DPR retriever like super heavy model. Okay, let's put a GPU node on it. But uh, maybe for some I don't know semi transformers or a sparse retriever um, CPU node um, and for the the reader model again something else and um and that's basically what you what you need to think of from a development perspective the re rest is more or less handled by ray um and uh, if you will think now about production use cases um it's really that you can let's say de deploy your pipeline and then let it auto scale and uh and with some restrictions that you say okay this node this retriever is always on the gpu or like this many gpus and, and please equip uh, a new resource, uh, spin up a new machine if the traffic is kind of growing. Mm -hmm. And, um, and uh, I would say what, what we are doing is basically using this Ray framework under the hood, uh, again, building the orchestration on top so that it really works for, for these NLP pipelines, retrieval-based pipelines. Um, um, yeah, but in the end of the developer doesn't really need to worry about scaling anymore. So it's usually you need uh, like a single cloud instance and then Ray will wrap say like Docker containers that partial like partition up the single cloud instance or is it you have multiple machine multiple cloud machines that Ray is routing it through uh, entirely different machines or it's kind of like a hybrid between the two where uh, Ray say constructs these Docker containers and say how many, how, what percentage of the resources say to use on each machine. And then it kind of routes through that. Is that kind of the correct understanding of it? Uh, yeah, kind of. So it's really, I would say like a similar, a bit similar to a Kubernetes cluster. Um, and uh, you still have usually multiple really machines on the cloud. And then on top you have this, basically this Ray cluster, which makes use of these machines. You have like a master node, you have some, uh, some additional nodes and, uh, and, and you can, split then the resources independently. So you can say really, okay, I want to use for this node uh, 1.5 GPUs and, uh, and Ray will take care of placing this uh, within the cluster and within the machines. Super cool. And so kind of as like a question of wrapping this up, I want to, I'm curious about uh, like, as I personally have been kind of navigating deep learning technology and uh, trying to learn how to build things, I thought I found it very useful to have kind of like one application in mind that I would really like to see come together. Is that, or compared to say, where you're building out a, a technology company like Haystack and you see all these different use cases, what do you think about kind of the philosophy of either looking at like, thinking about things that will generalize to all the applications or maybe digging into one specific thing that you would really like to see come to life, like the podcast search, for example. Yeah, I mean, so what we are, I mean, there's a lot of use cases out there uh, that we are super curious to, uh, to see and, uh, uh, um, and really like when, this, when we see that from community or from clients. But um, we as a company are not, let's say, building or focusing on one of these solutions, um, but we really, let's say, enable these use cases mm -hmm. and build a platform that helps developers out there to build and to um, and to, um, to build these products and use cases as easily as possible. And uh, that's for me, uh, uh, we have like a Slack channel where we share this mm -hmm. regularly, like what mm -hmm. 
people from community share or like customers and it's just so fascinating to see like what what people build themselves instead of let's say hey we build or we provide uh, a solution for financial search right? it's like of course you can like optimize this endlessly um but it's quite narrow and uh, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, i'm a big fan of uh, giving this flexibility um and um yeah um at the same time probably yeah, building the tooling for let's say a few areas uh, to, to, to really make it easy to, to build these say, final use cases yeah and i think like anyone kind of working in almost like developer tools if you will like has to be able to have that kind of generalist hat thinking where you kind of are switching in a use case in your head and and yeah i think that's a really interesting way of thinking about it, it might be Do you think it's like harder to do it that way to keep adapting to some new thing? Yeah, I mean, it's like it's of course if you have something very generic, <laughs> it's I would say constant back and forth. Like you know, you have like your hypothesis, hey, that's what people need, and then you need kind of to wait for okay, that's what they actually built with it, and that's how they used it, and this was maybe helpful, this not, but you always think reliant on this feedback loop to understand and. Uh, And that's why I think it's uh, it's so important to to do that on open source because the <laughs> feedback loop is quite faster. You see what people are doing, what helps them, what not, and uh, and really helps to build a nice developer tooling. And uh, imagine you're closed source; you always have to I don't know sell it to someone, ask them for feedback. Um, it's just way smaller, way way slower. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Mal, for coming on the WeVA podcast and. Uh, to anyone listening, I highly recommend checking out the DeepSet Cloud. Uh, it's a graphic user interface for setting up this Haystack pipeline where you uh, select your language, you upload your data. You can even drag and drop PDFs. They have a PDF extractor built into the Haystack library that could, you know, you could drag in some, say, archive PDFs and then get your first vector search going that way. And it's a super cool way and in, in, uh, clicking around the pipeline. I think it's one of the most exciting uh, ways to visualize what's going on with plugging these different parts of this end-to-end -end retrieval augmented pipeline together. So again, thank you so much, Malt, for coming on the WeVA podcast. And thank you everyone to uh, listening and please subscribe for more uh, podcasts like this.